There you are. Wow. Weird. Saturday afternoon, sitting inside with my sunglasses on. Weird. Speaking of weird, have you checked out Dark Side of Oz? Otherwise known as, uh, what, Dark Side of the Rainbow or The Wizard of Floyd? Now, you probably wouldn't get it, but your parents would. Anyway, back in the day, people used to watch The Wizard of Oz and turn the volume down and put on Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. Uncanny, weird. It's like it's supposed to be. I mean, the music meshes with every scene, in the, well, maybe not every scene, but a lot of it. Something to do. You don't even have to get the movie and the record nowadays. They have this thing called YouTube. Bet you know about it. Anyway, somebody's done it for you. They've just got, you know, the album queued up with the movie. It's pretty good. Something to do. Kills a little time. Speaking of killing time, are you into uh, a few more pages of uh, Natalie Babette's Tuck Everlasting? Let's see, last we left, Winnie wanted to run away from home. She was so sick of being in the yard all the time. Um, she decided to go out into the woods. Um, some dude was at her house in a yellow suit the day before asking a lot of questions about the woods. She's out there in it. She meets this kid named Jesse. He's drinking from a spring. She goes to drink from the spring and he says, don't do it. Next thing you know, uh, his mother, Jesse's mother, Ma Tuck, and uh, some kid named Miles come up and they grab Winnie and haul her off. And on the way out of the woods, they see the man with the yellow horse or the yellow suit. And she doesn't say anything to him, but he sees her. And I think Ma Tuck makes up something like, oh, we're teaching her how to ride. Anyway, it's all very confusing. But I think it'll come clear in part two. So sit back, relax. Here's uh, part two of Tuck Everlasting. I think I'm going to do about 30 pages. It went on a long time yesterday, didn't it? Wow, I think 40 minutes. This one will be shorter. Chapter seven, Tuck Everlasting by Natalie Babette. It was the strangest story Winnie had. Oh, I always like to rewind a little bit, don't I? Look here, Winnie Foster, said Jesse. We're friends. We really are. But you got to help us. Come sit down and we'll try to tell you why. Chapter 7. It was the strangest story Winnie had ever heard. She soon suspected that they had never told it before except to each other. And she was the first real audience for they gra gathered around her like children at their mother's knee, each trying to claim her attention. And sometimes they all talked at once and interrupted each other in their eagerness. 87 years before, the Tucks had come from a long way to the east looking for a place to settle. In those days, the wood was not a wood, it was a forest, just as her grandmother had said, a forest that went on and on and on. They had thought they would start a farm as soon as they came to the end of the trees but the trees never seemed to end. When they came to the part that was now the wood, they turned from the trail to find a camping place. They happened on a spring. Oh, it was real nice, said Jesse with a sigh. It looked just the way it looks now. A clearing, lots of sunshine, and that big tree with all those knobby roots. We stopped and everyone took a drink, even the horse. No, said May, the cat didn't drink, that's important. Yes, Miles said, don't leave that out. We all had a drink except for the cat. Well, anyways, Jesse went on. The water tasted sort of strange, but we camped there overnight and Pa carved a T on the tree trunk to mark where we'd been. And then we went on. They had come out of the forest at last many miles to the west and found a thinly populated valley and started their farm. We put up a house for Ma and Pa, said Miles, and a little shack for Jesse and me. We figured we'd be starting families of our own pretty soon and we want our own houses. That was the first time we figured out there was something peculiar, said May. Jesse fell out of a tree. I was way up in the middle, Jesse interrupted, trying to saw off some of the big branches. Before we cut her down, I lost my balance and fell. He landed plumb on his head, said May with a shudder. Oh, we thought for sure he broke his neck, but come to find out, didn't hurt him a bit. Not long after, Miles went on, some hunters come by one day at sunset, and the horse was out grazing by some trees, and they shot him. Mistook him for a deer, they said. Can you fancy that? But the thing is, they didn't kill him. The bullet went right on through him. Didn't hardly even make a mark. Then Pa got snake bit, and Jesse ate a poison toadstool. And I cut myself, said May, remember, slicing bread? But it was the passage of time that worried them most. They had worked the farm, settled down, made friends. But after 10 years, and then 20, they had to face the fact that there was something terribly wrong. None of them was getting any older. 
it was more than 40 years by then, said May said sadly. I was married and I had two children, but from the look of me, I was still 22. My wife, she finally made up her mind and I, that I'd sold my soul to the devil. She left me. Oh, this was Miles talking. She left me and she went away and took the children with her. Well, I'm glad I never got married, Jesse put in. It was the same with our friends, said May. They'd come to pull back from us. There was talk about witchcraft, black magic. Well, you can't hardly blame them, but finally we had to leave the farm. We didn't know where to go. We started back the way we come, just wandering. We was like gypsies. When we got this far, it changed, of course. A lot of the trees was gone, and there was people and tree gap. It was a new village. The road was here, but in those days it was mostly a cow path. We went on into what's left of the woods to make a camp, and when we got to the clearing and the tree and the spring, we remembered it from before. It hadn't changed no more than we had, said Miles. And that's how we found out. Pa, pa carved a tea on the tree. Remember, 20 years before, but the tea was just where it had been when he had done it. That tree hadn't grown one wilt in the whole time. It was exactly the same. And the tea he carved out was as fresh as it had been there, put there the day before. Then they had remembered drinking the water, they and the horse, but not the cat. The cat had lived a long and happy life on the farm, but had died some 10 years before. So they decided at last that the source of their changelessness was the spring. When we come to that conclusion, Ma went on, Tuck said, that's my husband, Angus Tuck. He said he had to be sure for once and for all. He took his shotgun and he pointed it at himself the best way he could. And before we could stop him, he pulled the trigger. There was a long pause. May's fingers laced together in her lap, twisted with the tension of remembering. At last, she said, that shot knocked him down, went into his heart. It had to the way he aimed and right on through him, scarcely even made a mark. Just like, well, you know, just like you shot a bullet through water. And he was just the same as if he'd never done it. Well, after that, we all sort of went crazy, said Jesse, grinning at the memory. Heck, we was going to live forever. Can you picture what it felt like to find that out? But then we sat down and talked it over, said Miles. And we're still talking it over, Jesse added. And we figured it'd be very bad if everyone knowed about that spring, said May. We begun to see what it would mean, she peered at Winnie. Do you understand, child? That water, it stops you right where you are. If you had a drink of it today, well, you'd, st you'd stay a little girl forever. You'd never grow up, not never. We don't know how it works or even why, said Miles. Pa thinks it's something left over from, well, from some other plan for the way the world should be, said Jesse. Some plan that didn't work out too good. And so everything was changed, except that spring was passed over somehow or other. Maybe he's right, I don't know. But you see, Winnie Foster, when I told you before that I'm 104 years old, I was telling the truth, but I'm really only 17. And so far as I know, I'll stay 17 till the end of the world. Would you wanna be 17 forever? Would you wanna be any age forever? If you were gonna be some age forever, what age would you choose to be? I'm thinking 61, that's a great age. Chapter eight, Winnie did not believe in fairy tales. She had never longed for a magic wand and did not expect to marry a prince and was scornful most of the time of her grandmother's elves. So now she sat, mouth open, wide eyes, not knowing what to make of this extraordinary story. It couldn't, not a bit of it be true. And yet, it feels so fine to tell somebody, Jesse exploded. Just think, Winnie Foster, you're the only person in the world besides us who knows about it. Hold on, said Miles cautiously. Maybe not. Well, there might be a whole lot of others, for all we know, wandering around just like us. Maybe, but we don't know them, Jesse pointed out. We never had anyone but us to talk to about it. Winnie, isn't it peculiar? The kind of, it's kind of wonderful. Just think of all the things we've seen in the world and all the things we're going to see. That kind of talk will make her want to rush back and drink a gallon of the stuff, warned Miles. There's a whole lot more to it than Jesse Tuck's good times, you know. Oh, stuff, said Jesse with a shrug. Well, we might as well enjoy it, long as we can't change it. You don't have to be such a parson all the time. 
I'm not being a parson, said Miles. I just think you ought to take it more serious. Now, boys, said May. She was kneeling by the stream, splashing her face and hands with cool water. Whew, such weather, she exclaimed, sitting back on her heels. She unfastened the brooch, took off her shawl, and toweled her dripping face. Well, child, see, she said to Winnie, standing up, now you share our secret. Oh, it's a big, dangerous secret. We got to have your help to keep it. I expect you're full of questions, but we can't stay here no longer. She tied the shawl around her waist and then, and sighed, it pains me to think how your ma and pa will worry, but well, there's just no way around it. We got to take you home with us. That's the plan. Tuck, he'll know what to do. He'll talk it out. He'll make sure you can see why you can't tell no one. But we'll bring you back tomorrow, all right? And all three of them looked at her, hopefully. All right, said Winnie, for she decided there wasn't any choice. She'd have to go. They'd probably make her go anyway, no matter what she said. But she felt like there was nothing to be afraid of. Well, not really. They seemed gentle, gentle and in a strange way, childlike. They made her feel old. And the way they spoke to her, the way they looked at her, made her feel special, important. It was a warm, spreading feeling, entirely new. She liked it. And in spite of their story, she liked them too, especially Jessie. But it was Miles who took her hand and said, it's really fine to have you along, even if it's only for a day or two. And then Jessie gave a mighty whoop and leaped into the stream, splashing mightily. What'd you bring for breakfast, Ma, he cried. We can eat on the way, can't we? I'm starving. So with the sun riding high now in the sky, they started off again, noisy in the August stillness, eating bread and cheese. Jessie sang funny old songs in a loud voice and swung like a monkey from the branches of trees, showing off shamelessly for Winnie, calling to her, hey, Winnie Foster, watch me, and hey, look what I can do. And Winnie laughed at him, lost the last of her alarm. They were friends, her friends, and she was running away after all, but she was not alone. Closing the gate on her oldest fears, she had closed the gate on her own fenced yard and discovered the wings she always wished she had. And all at once, she was elated. Where were the terrors she had been told she should expect? She could not recognize them anywhere. The sweet earth opened out its wide four corners to her like the petals of a flower ready to be picked. And it shimmered with light and possibility till she was dizzy with it. Her mother's voice, the feel of home receded for the moment and her thoughts turned forward. Why, she too might live forever in this remarkable world she was only just discovering. The story of the spring, it might be true. So that when she was not rolling along on the back of the fat old horse, by choice this time, she ran, shouting down the road, her arms flung out, making more noise than anybody. It was good. So good, in fact, that through it all, not one of them had noticed that the man that they had passed on the road, the man in the yellow suit, had crept up to the bushes by the stream and heard it all, the whole fantastic story. Nor did they notice that he was following now, beside the road, far behind, his mouth above the thin gray beard turned ever so slightly toward a smile. Chapter 9 the August sun rolled up, hung at mid-heaven for a blinding hour, and at last wheeled westward before the journey was done. See, if I had written this, I would have said, it was noon. That's it. The August sun rolled up, hung at mid-heaven for a blinding hour, and at last wheeled westward before the journey was done. Natalie Babette is an artist. But when he was exhausted before that, Miles carried her some of the way. The tops of her cheeks were bright pink with sunburn, her nose a vivid comic red, but she had been rescued more from a more serious broiling by May, who had finally insisted that she wear the blue straw hat. It came down far over her ears and gave her a clownish appearance, but the shade from its brim was so welcome that Winnie put vanity aside and dozed gratefully in Miles' strong arms. Her own arms wound round his neck. The pastures, fields, and scrubby groves they crossed were vigorous with bees and crickets slept before them as if each step released a spring and flung them up like pebbles. But everything else was motionless, dry as a biscuit, on the brink of burning, 
hoarding final reservoirs of sap, trying to hold out till the rain returned and the Queen Anne's lace lay dusty on the surface of the meadows like foam on a painted sea. My God, this woman can write. It was amazing then to climb a long hill to see ahead another hill and beyond that deep green of scattered pine forest. And when you climbed to feel the air ease and soften, Winnie revived, sniffling, and was able to ride the horse again, perched behind May, and to her oft-repeated question, are we almost there? The welcome answer came at last. Only a few more minutes now. A wide stand of dark pine trees rose up, loomed near, and suddenly Jesse was crying, we're home. This is it, Winnie Foster. And he and Miles raced on and disappeared among the trees. The horse followed, turning into a rutted path, lumpy with roots and it was as if they had slipped in under a giant colander. The late sun's brilliance could penetrate only a scattered glimmers, and everything was silent and untouched, the ground muffled with moss and sliding needles. The graceful arms of the pine stretched out protectively in every direction, and it was cool, blessedly cool and green. The horse picked up its way carefully, and then ahead of the path dropped down a steep embankment and beyond that. Winnie, peering around May's bulk, saw a flash of color and a dazzling sparkle. Down the embankment they swayed, and there, in a plain, homely little house, barn red and below it, the last of the sun flashing on the wrinkled surface of a tiny lake. Oh, look, Winnie cried, water! At the same time, they heard two enormous splashes, two voices roaring with pleasure. It don't take them more than a minute to pile into that pond, said May Beeman. Well, you can't blame them in this heat like this. You can go too if you want. And then they were at the door of the little house, and Tuck was standing there. Where's the child, he demanded, for Winnie was hidden behind his wife. The boys say you brung along a real, honest-to-goodness, natural child. So I did, said May, sliding down off the horse, and here she is. Winnie's shyness returned at once when she saw the big man with his sad face and baggy trousers. But he gazed at her. The warm, pleasing feeling spread through her again. For Tuck's head tilted to one side, his eyes went soft, and the gentlest smile in the world displaced the melancholy creases on his cheeks. He reached up to lift her from the horse's back, and he said, Well, there's just no words to tell you how happy I am to see you. It's the finest thing that's happened in... He, erupt, he interrupted himself, setting Winnie on the ground, and he turned to May. Does she know? Of course she knows, said May. That's why I brung her back. Winnie, this here's my husband, Angus Tuck. Tuck, meet Winnie Foster. How do, Winnie Foster, said Tuck, shaking Winnie's hand rather solemnly. Well then, he straightened and peered down at her, and Winnie, looking back into his face, saw an expression there that made her feel like an unexpected present wrapped in pretty paper and tied with ribbons, in spite of May's blue hat, which still enveloped her head. Well then, Tuck repeated, seeing you know, I'll go on and say that well, this is the finest thing that's happened in well, at least 80 years. Chapter 10. Winnie had grown up with order. She was used to it. Under the pitiless double assaults of her mother and grandmother, the cottage where she lived was always squeaking clean, mopped and swept and scoured into limp submission. There was no room for carelessness, no putting things off until later. The foster women had made a fortress out of duty. Within it, they were indomitable, and Winnie was in training. So she was unprepared for the homely little house beside the pond, unprepared for the gentle eddies of dust, the silver cobwebs, and the mouse who lived, and welcome to him, in a table drawer. There were only three rooms. The kitchen came first, with an open cabinet where dishes were stacked in perilous towers without the least regard for their varying dimensions. There was an enormous black stove and a metal sink, and every surface, every wall was piled and strewn and hung with everything imaginable, from onions to lanterns to wooden spoons to wash tubs and in a corner stood Tuck's forgotten shotgun. The parlor came next, where the furniture, loose and sloping with age, was set about helter-skelter. An ancient green plush sofa lolled alone in the center, 
like yet another mossy fallen log facing a soot-streaked fireplace still deep in last winter's ashes. The table with the drawer that housed the mouse was pushed off, also alone, into a far corner, and three armchairs and an elderly rocker stood about aimlessly, like strangers at a party ignoring each other. Beyond this was the bedroom, where a vast and tipsy bass brass bed took up most of the space, but there was a room beside it for the washstand with a lonely mirror, and opposite its foot a carnivore, a cavernous oak wardrobe from which leaked the faint smell of camphor. Up a steep flight of narrow stairs was a dusty loft. That's where the boys sleep when they're home, May explained. And that was all, and yet it was not quite all, for there was everywhere evidence of their activities, May and tucks, her sewing, patches and scraps of bright cloth, half-completed quilts and braided rugs, a bag of cotton batting with wisps, of its content, like snow drifting into the cracks and corners, the arms of the sofa webbed with strands of thread and dangerous with needles, his wood carvings, curly shavings furring the floor, and little heaps of splinters and chips, every surface dim with the sawdust of countless sandings, limbs of unassembled dolls and wooden soldiers, a ship model propped on the mouse's table waiting for its glue to dry, and a stack of wooden bowls, their sides smooth to velvet, the topmost bowl filled with a jumble of big wooden spoons and forks, like dry bleached bones. We make things to sell, said Ma, surveying the mess approvingly. And still this was not all, for on the old beam ceiling of the parlor, streaks of light swam and danced and wavered like a bright mir mirage reflected through the windows from the sunlight surface of the pond. There were bowls of daisies everywhere, gay, white, and yellow, and over everything, the clean, sweet smell of the water and its weeds, the chatter of swooping kingfisher, the carol and trill of a dozen other kind of birds, and occasionally the thrilling bass note of an unastonished bullfrog at ease somewhere along the muddy banks. Into it all came Winnie, eyes wide and very much amazed. It was a whole new idea to her that people could live in such disarray, but at the same time, she was charmed. It was comfortable. Climbing behind May up the stairs to see the loft, she thought to herself, maybe it's because they think they have forever to clean up. And this was followed by another thought, far more revolutionary. Maybe they just don't care. The boys don't come home very much, said May, as they came up into the half light of the loft. But when they are, there's bed up there. There's plenty of room. The loft was cluttered, too, with all kinds of odds and ends. But there were two mattresses rolled out on the floor, and fresh seats, sheets and blankets were folded almost neatly on each, waiting to be spread. Where do they go when they're away? asked Winnie. What do they do? Oh, said May, they go different places, do different things. They work at what jobs they can get, try to bring home some of their money. Miles can do carpentry, and he's a pretty fair blacksmith, too. Jesse now, well, he don't ever seem too settled in himself. Of course, he's young. She stopped and smiled. That sounds funny, don't it? Still, it's true, just the same. So Jesse does what strikes him at the moment, working in the fields or in the saloons, things like that, whatever he can come across but they can't stay on in any one place for long, you know. None of us can. People get to wondering, she sighed. We've been in this house about as long as we dare, going on 20 years. Oh, it's a nice, right nice place. Tuck's got so, he's real attached to it. Then too, it's off by itself, plenty of fish in the pond, not too far from the towns around. When we need things, we go sometimes to one, sometimes the next, so people don't come to notice us too much. And we sell where we can, but I guess we'll be moving on one of these days. It's just about time. It sounded rather sad to Winnie, never to belong anywhere. That's too bad, she said, glancing shyly at May. Always moving around, never having any friends or anything. But May shrugged off this observation. Tuck and me, we got each other, she said, and that's a whole lot. The boys now, well, they go their separate ways. There's some different. Don't always get along too good, but they come home whenever the spirit moves, and every ten years, first week of August, they meet at the spring and come home togethers, 
so we can be a family again for a little while. That's why we was there this morning. One way or another, it all works out. She folded her arms and nodded, more to herself than to Winnie. Life's got to be lived, no matter how long or short, she said calmly. You got to take what comes. We just go along like everybody else one day at a time. Funny, we don't feel no different. Least way I don't. Sometimes I forget about what's happened to us. Forget it all together. And then sometimes it comes over me and I wonder why it happened to us. We're plain as salt, us tucks. We don't deserve no blessings, if it's a blessing. And likewise, I don't see how we deserve to be cursed, if it's a curse. Still, there's no use in trying to figure out why things fall the way they do. Things just are, and fussing don't bring changes. A tuck now, well, he's got a few other ideas, but well, I expect he'll tell you. There, the boys are in from the pond. Winnie heard a burst of voices downstairs, and in a moment, Miles and Jesse were climbing to the loft. Here, child, she said hastily, hide your eyes. Boys, are you decent? What'd you put on to swim in? I got Winnie up here, do you hear me? For goodness sake, Ma, said Jesse, emerging from the stairwell, you think we're gonna march around in our all together with Winnie Foster in the house? And Miles behind him said, we just jumped in with our clothes on, too hot and tired to shed them. <clears throat> it was true. They stood there side by side with their wet clothes plastered to their skins, little pools of water collecting at their feet. Well, said Ma, relieved, all right, find something dry to put on. Your pa's got supper nearly ready. And she hustled Winnie down the narrow stairs. It was a, chapter 11. It was a good supper. Flapjacks, bacon, bread, and applesauce, and they ate sat in about the parlor instead of around the table. Winnie had never had a meal that way before, and she watched them carefully at first to see what rules there might be that she did not know about. But there seemed to be no rules. Jessie sat on the floor and he used the seat of a chair for a table, but the others held their plates in their laps. There was no napkins, it was all right then to lick maple syrup from your fingers. Winnie was never allowed to do such a thing at home, but she had always thought it would be the easiest way. And suddenly the meal seemed luxurious. After a few minutes, however, it was clear to Winnie that there was at least one rule. As long as there was food to eat, there was no conversation. All four tucks kept their eyes and attention on the business at hand, and in the silence, given time to think, Winnie felt her elation and her thoughtless pleasure wobble and collapse. It had been different when they were all outdoors, where the world belonged to everyone and no one. Here, everything was theirs alone. Everything was done their way. Eating, she realized now, was a very personal thing, not something to do with strangers. Chewing was a personal thing, and yet here she was chewing with strangers in a strange place. She shivered a little and frowned, looked around at them, that story they had told her, why, well, they were crazy, she thought harshly, and they were criminals. They had kidnapped her right out there in the middle of the very, her very own woods, and now she'd be expected to sleep all night in this dirty, peculiar house? She had never slept in any bed but her own in her whole life. All these thoughts flowed at once from the dark part of her mind. She put her fork down and said unsteadily, I want to go home. The tuck stopped eating and looked at her surprised. May said soothingly, well, well, of course you do, child, that's only natural. I'll take you home, I promised I would, soon as if we've explained it a bit to you on why you've got to promise you'll never tell about the spring. That's the only reason we brung you here. We got to make you see why. Then Miles said cheerfully and with sudden sympathy, there's a pretty good old rowboat. I'll take you out for a row after supper. No, I will, said Jesse. Let me. I found her first, didn't I? Winnie Foster, listen, I'll show you where the frogs are and hush. Tuck interrupted. Everyone hushed. I'll take Winnie rowing on the pond. There's a good deal to be said, and I think we better hurry up and say it. I got a feeling there ain't a whole lot of time. Jesse laughed at this and ran a hand roughly through his curls. That's funny, Pa. Seems to me like time's the only thing we got a lot up. But May frowned. You worried, Tuck? What's got you? No one saw us on our way up. Well, now, wait just a minute. Come to think of it, someone did. There was a man on the road just outside a tree gap, but well, he didn't say nothing. He knows me, though, said Winnie. She had forgotten, too, about the man in the yellow suit, and now thinking of him, she felt a strange surge of relief. He'll tell my father he saw me. He knows you? 
said May, her frowning deepened. Why didn't you call out to him, child? Why not? I'm scared to do anything, said Winnie honestly. Tuck shook his head. I never thought we'd come to the place where we'd be scaring children, he said. I guess there's no way to make it up to you, Winnie, but I'm sure most awful sorry it had to happen like that. Now, who was this man you saw? I don't know his name, said Winnie, but he's a pretty nice man, I guess. In fact, he seems supremely nice to her now, a kind of a savior. But then she added, he came into our house last night, or came to our house last night, but he didn't go inside. Well, that don't sound too serious, Pa, said Miles, just some stranger passing by. Just the same, we gotta get you home, Winnie, said Tuck, standing up decisively. We gotta get you home just as fast as we can. I got a feeling this whole thing's gonna come apart like wet bread. But the first thing, we got to talk, and the pond's the best place. The pond's got answers. Come along, child. Let's go out to the water. I guess that's a good place to stop. So he's gonna take her out there, and he's gonna row in a boat. And I guess somehow he's gonna explain the whole thing to her. Would you clean your house if you were gonna live forever? I think I would. I like a clean house. But maybe after a while you wouldn't care. I don't know. This book gives you lots of stuff to think about. Well, we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Adios, my friends.